Yeah, today we're going to really focus on the residential aspects of green building um, as far as what kind of programs exist out there. Um, of course, that gets into the commercial realm a little bit, and I'll kind of cover um, you know, how those connections are made here. Um, if anybody is uh, approved for or does need continuing ed in any of these phenomenal uh, programs, um, I can get you a certificate, so let me know, and we'll get that to you for listening in. Um, the Green Home Institute uh, is a nonprofit. We've been around since 2000, so about 16 years now. Um, we have uh, certified over 7,000 homes, worked on nearly 12,000 homes, single family, multifamily throughout the Midwest, um, educated um, tens of thousands of professionals, and um, our mission is to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Um, our real name is the Alliance for Environmental Sustainability, but we rebranded two years ago because, as you know, you probably don't know what I just said, so. <laughs> uh, I gotta thank our huge Platinum Plus sponsor, Anderson Window Oil, we're here. Uh, check them out if you guys are changing your windows or your parents are calling you and saying, hey, are we changing, we're gonna change some windows, what should we do? Have them call Anderson. So anyway, um, the first thing to know about green building is that it begins with energy efficiency. Uh, energy efficiency is always the gateway drug to the green building movement. It was sort of the first place to start. It's the first place, if you talk to someone and they have no clue what's going on, don't overwhelm them with green building. Just get them started on and get them hooked on the efficiency side. So we're looking at the envelope, um, how tight a building is, how insulated it is, the heating and cooling systems. Um, how heating and cooling is distributed through the house for comfort reasons, the efficiencies of the appliances, LED lightings, you know, that's simple stuff now. And then what programs can help you do that, and we'll cover some of those. Um, once you get good at energy, the next concern is indoor air quality, indoor environmental quality, uh, health. Once you start to tighten a home up, um, once you start to tighten a multifamily building up, you get lots of issues with health concerns in a tighter building. And so that's the next thing you want to do is start addressing those issues um, in your next project. And part of that has to do with preventing moisture and water intrusion into a building, which is huge. Um, lots of energy efficient homes out there, lots of homes being weatherized out there, um, but they are rotting and that's no good to anybody. So keeping water out of a home, keeping radon out, which is the second cause of lung cancer, um, pests, um, is there carbon, is there combustion going on in the basement, and if so, how are we managing that combustion um, when you're looking at health? And there are programs to help do that. Once you get past the energy and the health aspects, uh, you start to look at the other main aspects of green. Where is my site at? What's on my lot? How many community uh, resources are walking distance from where I'm at? What kind of materials am I using? Where are they coming from? What are they made out of? And where are they going at the end of their life? And what impact are they having on people? Um, water conservation, pretty straightforward. And um, you know, what, uh, how, how are you managing uh, waste during a project? Uh, how can you um, uh, diminish your, your waste during a renovation or new construction? Are all sort of that next level above health and energy. Um, and then renewables is kind of that last piece, um, I think. Um, once you've got some good health strategies down, water conservation, your materials, your energy, renewable energy is that, that next place you want to go. And that's kind of where we get into with some of the other programs that go beyond green and what we call restorative design, reparative um, living design, looking at net positive energy, looking at climate resilient buildings uh, that will withstand the extreme weathers that are already coming as of yesterday was a massive extreme weather event. Um, how to remediate black water, how to capture and clean your own water on site to use it, um, how to test for air quality, and how to make sure you have a home that's accessible to anybody, no matter where they're at in their life or what kind of challenge they have. Um, this is what a reparative, restorative building is. Um, so the first thing to know is that green building is really a, a market shift or a continuum, and really what you have on the um, on your left side is basically, uh, you know, when people are designing building buildings, unfortunately we get a few who are just, you know, not even meeting the code uh, and getting away with it. Um, but the most the majority of people are building to the code or some aspect of the code or what we call building barely legal. But the green builders are the ones who are making the shift in the market, the 20%, top 20% of builders who are getting engaged and trying to sh continually 
shift that market and transition it to a more sustainable uh, style. And then there's a 5% that are looking at the, uh, you know, how far really can we go into that restorative, reparative side of things. And then the other thing to know is that these programs all sort of fall on a sustainability continuum. Um, how sustainable are they and where are they leading you to? And uh, where are the ones that you want, where do you find yourself at in your projects or with your client projects or at the type of place you want to work at? What, where along that scale are they at and how can you help them get to that next level? So that's really the question we ask is, we ask of builders, we ask of architects, we ask of students, we ask of consultants, um, even homeowners when we work with them. You know, where is it that you are with your projects, with your home, with your designs, and where do you want to get to, and how can we help you get there is really what, uh, what we do. So. so those are some goals you have to ask yourself, um, and you have to ask your clients, and you have to ask your staff, um, uh, where, where are you building? Um, where are you building? I wrote that while I was really tired last night. Where are you building? Uh, what does the market look like? Um, what, uh, what, what, what kind of programs are relevant in your market? What does the code look like? What are uh, what is important to people in the market? That's a question you have to ask. Um, does the program have recognition in that market? Could it get recognition? Um, you know, would people easily see if this home was selling as a lead home? Hey, that makes sense. I get that. Um, are there any incentives to help you accomplish the goals that you want to accomplish as far as the green building program that you pick? Um, what are the costs? So. Soft costs, certification costs, um, radar costs, have a radar come through and inspect it. Um, what, uh, oh, and what are the hard costs? So what are the costs going to be, like, is it 10%, 15%? Is it more affordable to actually follow the program in some aspects? Those are some things you want to ask yourself. Um, and then third-party oversight. What is the stringency of the person doing the inspection and testing of the home? And is that important to you to have more third-party versus second-party verification to ensure that the home is done right. Um, does it require any kind of education or training or credential, like being a lead AP? Does that help? Those are some questions you might want to ask. Um, what are your personal and political beliefs? Some of these programs have peer political affiliations, and they give their money to political parties on both sides. Um, some of them have certain aspects and beliefs behind them, moral beliefs. Um, certain beliefs about the way the world works. So do they align, do these programs align with your own beliefs? And what level of green are they? Again, where do you want to be um, from, all the way from lawbreaker to barely legal to restorative? Where do you want to be at and, and where can you um, engage? So um, as I'm going through this, there's a lot of stuff to cover, but I want to make sure I get through everything that you guys want to hear, so um, please just interject, raise your hand. I'd prefer to have a conversation um, than do questions at the end. So um, please just cut me off and say, hey, can you explain that a little bit more or whatever. So, so the first thing I want to start with is the baseline, as I mentioned, energy efficiency um, in homes. So we're basically, we're looking at um, labeling programs, MPG for homes, miles per gallon. The idea, the concept is, just like you buy a car, you look at the MPG rating, what is it going to cost me to operate this? In the future, when you go to buy a home, or even a multifamily building, you're going to say, what are the utility bills? What is the home rated? How much gas mileage can I get out of this thing? What's it going to cost me to operate it? Um, those are going to be very simple things. And eventually, they'll just be integrated and mandated. So you know, we'll see that coming down the line you know, sooner or later in certain aspects. Um, so the first one, the one that's trending, is the Department of Energy Home Energy Score, uh, really sort of launched by uh, Joe Biden and just taken off. Um, states all over the country are committing thousands of homes to this score. We've already scored nearly 100 homes in Holland through a program under this. And this is basically a 1 through 10 label that says, hey, to the, to the home buyer, if I'm going to buy a home in this neighborhood and it's got a 7, but the one over here has an 8, it's going to save me a little bit more money to buy the one with an eight. So you, in all things considered, you would consider the score of a home. Um, so pretty straightforward. And it's labeled by an uh, independent auditor who's qualified to come through and inspect the home. Um, it works for um, mostly just single family housing. It does not work for multifamily housing as far as the home energy score program goes. 
and it's usually typically used to make better decisions in the renovation process. If you're trying to pull a 203k loan for a mortgage, whether you're refinancing or buying a new home, now some of the new rules are if you want to get an energy efficiency mortgage, you have to get a home energy score of six at the lease. So this stuff is built right into the mortgage now, and then the realtors go, oh, I get it. So the next level is the HERS index, and this is the one that came around the 80s. This is basically a, an EPA program started by ResNet. This is the one that's used on a majority of new construction and low-rise multifamily housing, as you can see there. Um, uh, not really used in big commercial buildings and can some degree be used in four to five story buildings. Um, about a third of all new construction projects in the country and growing are getting this. Um, there's a federal tax uh, deduction for this program. Uh, it's getting built into most of all the codes. What it basically says is you have a, a hundred on the, on the rating system and if, um, for every one lower than a hundred it's a one percent increase in energy efficiency all the way down to zero which is basically a zero energy home. There are homes at negative 22 um, down in Florida for example that are generating way more energy than they use. So again it's another way to say if I'm building a new home and I want to have a certain level of efficiency and savings in the house you know what level can I get to and the rater sort of tosses in all of the energy aspects and outspits these numbers. Um, and it makes it really easy for new home builders um, who can say, who can market to this thing and say, yeah, we build at this level. Um, for any of you who look and dabble into the commercial buildings or high rise multifamily buildings, well, we use the ASHRAE um, for that. Um, and so that's looking at ASHRAE 90.1. They have 62.1 and 62.2 for um, air quality. But ASHRAE 90.1 is a way to model a building um, that's much larger, commercial based, has some other things going on than a home. So you don't use it in a single family home, but we see it in four stories and up um, multifamily and mixed use uh, buildings. Um, and so yeah, there you go again. Um, more in that, more in those larger scales for the uh, the ASHRAE energy modeling, and we're seeing a lot of firms, you know, doing this stuff, bringing it right in and, and making it a normal component. The Michigan Energy Code 2007 uh, basically is the ASHRAE 2007 code, if that puts you into some context. And um, and if you were at the ASHRAE 2013, if you saw there's a 2013, then you're like 30 percent above that. Um, has some more context for energy efficiency. Um, energy Star doesn't just certify light bulbs and appliances, they actually certify whole homes. They've been doing this since the 80s. Um, and now they look at more than just energy efficiency and how tight the thermal envelope is. Um, they're looking at commissioning. So just like in a commercial building, an HVAC contractor would commission an HVAC system to make sure it's operating right. Now, in the Energy Star program, you're having a credentialed EPA contractor who's been trained going in and making sure all of the systems, all of the ducts, ducts are sized correctly, all of the air is being distributed through the home at a comfortable rate, uh, all of the systems are fine tuned and working. Um, not only that, but now Energy Star is saying, just like I said, water management. From the top, from the time the rain hits the house to where it splashes to where it goes, how do we keep that house dry? and stop it from rotting. Some very simple recommendations that they require before you can certify to an Energy Star program. So it's almost more than just energy, it's sort of a comfort slash durability, um, almost health-based program now that the Energy Star program has evolved into. Um, on, the, on the commercial side, it's different. They use EPA portfolio manager and you basically just drop in some utility bills and you get an Energy Star score, and that's it. It's not looking at any of this stuff. So very different, different world in commercial. Uh, this is more for um, uh, the single-family homes and low-rise residential, and up to four to five-story mid-rise buildings, um, depending if you have decentralized HVAC systems. So you know, not big central systems, but per-unit systems. Um, Energy Star really doesn't work for additions or remodels because it really requires a full thermal envelope be exposed and a, a third party rater inspect to make sure it's fully air sealed and that there's a full air 
um, full air barrier aligned, which is hard to do in an existing home. Uh, it's also looking at the slab insulation of the house. Um, and, and so that's hard to do in an existing home unless you plan on tearing out the slab. It really only makes sense on, on major gut rehabs for the Energy Star program. Um, I'll, again, a lot of builders are using this. There's um, some tax credits, some tax incentives for using this program. Um, Consumers Energy here uh, will give you a rebate if you build a new Energy Star home that's a majority of it's all electric. Uh, so geothermal heating um, or air source heat pumps um, for the home. So this one, so, so this program is tied to a utility rebate, so that's just ongoing. Um, the, the HERS, the other rating I talked about, the HERS index rating here, that one has a tax deduction which, yes, does end this year, has been always reapproved, except last year's mysteriously was not. But then it was back approved in December, so yeah. Yeah, yep. That's 100 is a 2006 code. So 2006. Yeah, yep. One thing to note, there was a study done on 71,000 Energy Star versus non-Energy Star single-family homes. And what they found was that the Energy Star certified homeowners uh, were 32% less likely to default on their mortgage. Um, so it just goes to show energy efficiency how much money you're pouring into heating and cooling um, your home, um, some of that money can be uh, used to divert um, uh, a financial crisis during an economic downturn, which hopefully doesn't happen again. But very interesting to see that you know energy is a big part of housing costs to consider. Um, so the EPA also says, OK, you got the energy stuff figured out. Do you want to go further? And they've created a program called Indoor Air Plus that the rater can take a look at. And so here again, we're looking at more air quality things that you need to address in a building, and you can actually certify this building. Uh, again, radon, um, preventing pests, having a st stabilized humidity, so it's not the extremes in the summer or the winter. Uh, they start to look at the paints and the emissions from the paints in this program. Um, MERV filtration simply just means um, a higher rated filter, so if you see those thicker filters, you can do them thin now, but the thicker ones in the furnace means they're just catching more bacteria, viruses, VOCs out of the air. Um, and then having preoccupancy ventilation, so, you know, kind of airing a house out after you've done the construction to prevent anybody from being exposed to anything in the home. Uh, they also have the water sense program, which you can take a look at from the EPA. And that looks at um, uh, the water efficiency, leakage. Uh, believe it or not, but if you have an overpressurized water system in your home coming in from the pressure is coming from the city or your, you know, your well, um, more pressure leads to further leaks and cracks. Also, if you, you know, you've got aerators, they're rated at what, 1.5, one gallon per minute. You know, that's how you measure your flow rates. If you've got too much pressure coming into your house or your building, those flow rates, those ratings don't mean anything. It's actually going to be faster and, and it's not going to live up to its low rating. So water pressure has a huge impact on a building. Um, and then even they get into water quality. Look at what's going on in Flint now. We can't ignore water quality anymore. What is the quality of the water that's coming into my house? What's in there? And how are we filtering it um, based on the situation that we're in? Um, very important. So that's another certification from the EPA that goes in line with the Energy Star program. Uh, and one thing that they have is this really cool interactive water budget tool. Um, and you can go online if you're, design, if you're a landscape architect or you're working with your LA or you're not, let me, let me take that back. You don't have to be a landscape architect to use this tool. It's pretty straightforward. And you can go in and you can put your site plans, how much, how much square footage you have for certain types of bushes, uh, certain types of grasses, plants, and it'll outspit um, a water budget for your site or your client's site and it will tell you how much water you're planning on using and you can tweak it a little bit to see okay why don't we try to get that outdoor water usage down by changing some of the different applications that we have um, and then of course you can pick up lead or uh, water sense points um, through
through this tool. But it's free to use. You can go right online and. Um, yeah, yeah, just Google the interactive water budget tool from the EPA. It's on the water census website, too. So. OK, so we're kind of, you know, we started with just basic energy scoring, went to sort of durability strategies, um, whole house commissioning, HVAC commissioning. Now you have the Department of Energy's Zero Energy Ready Home Program. Um, this is a very interesting program. It's basically designed to say, let's build a super tight, super energy efficient home using those other programs that we talked about, and um, let's make it ready to go zero energy. So we're saying, renewables don't make sense right now in my market. They, don't, they cost too much. They're illegal, whatever. Um, but that's OK. We're going to design the home so that in the future, you just pop some, usually solar, but you can do wind too, but usually solar, right on it. And it's, you know, we're going to get to zero with it. So it's sort of pre-designed for the future. Um, so what this looks at is using the HERS index, zero through 100 rating system that we talked about as its baseline. And then you're looking at the Energy Star 3 program as a certification requirement, and the 2012 International Energy Code certification, which if you know anything about that, Illinois, Maryland, they're all in that code. Um, then you also have to do an indoor air plus and water sense home. So it's again looking at more than just energy. It's looking at air quality, water efficiency, water conservation, and then you can achieve the zero energy program. And what they're looking at here is that the home has enough south-facing roof space on it so you can put the proper amount of PV based on what your energy modeling is telling you. Um, and then, then it's also pre-wired for, for solar so that you, know, you don't have to call up the electrician and do a bunch of monkeying when you want to put solar on. It's just ready to go. The voltage is ready to go. Um, and that uh, everything's there. So, so again, you build this home, and then five years, solar comes down to where the homeowner wants it, and then they buy it. So this is pretty popular out west uh, and east coast, not so much in Michigan right now. Uh, and it can be used, um, let's see here. Yeah, it can be used on a majority of multifamily housing. But again, it requires Energy Star, so very difficult to do on a, on a rehab. Plus, you'd have to maybe change the whole roof line around. So. OK, so building on that, we have Passive House. Anyone heard of Passive House? All right. So Passive House started here during the energy crisis. And then when the energy crisis went away, we stopped caring about energy efficiency and just built homes with a little bit of fiberglass just tacked up poorly. And now it's just slipping down. Um, and, and went to the Germans. And they're like, I love this. Let's do this. So they really did it. And, and then they exported it back here. And we said, OK, Germans, you have one climate zone. We have a lot. This is terrible. We're going to make our own. So the folks in the US or in Illinois just blew this thing up. So I'm going to talk mostly about the US version here, but love the Germans and love what they're doing. Um, and they d decided to create the Passive House Institute uh, US. Um, so this program, again, now requires a HERS index rating um, as a baseline, requires that you use Energy Star and IECC 2012 requires that you do indoor air plus and water sense. So Passive House, a lot of people complain about Passive House. They say it's just an energy program. All it focuses on energy. It doesn't look at air or water. You're just going to go live in a box, and it, you won't be able to breathe in it. Uh, and it's going to be ugly. Um, but so little I know, they actually decided to say, we're going to require all these other programs as our baseline. We're going to work with them. So as you can imagine, they've you know, partnered with the Department of Energy and said, you know, this is important to us. We want a zero energy ready passive house home um, for, our, for us. But so zero energy ready, you know, the thing about it is, is it's like it needs a lot of solar. Passive house is basically saying, you know, you're zero energy ready and you are only going to need very minimal amount of solar because we're going to make it an even tighter, super tight building. Um, passive house can be. The name Passive House is interesting because it can actually be used for anything. Um, there are 20 story buildings um, using Passive House certification, all commercial. Um, so it should really be called Passive Building. Um, they have a special program called Energy Fit for remodels that kind of give you some special guidance, kind of scale things down a little bit. Um, but otherwise, it can be fully used for all types of uh, 
new constructions and building types. Um, but uh, you know, one thing to note about the program, it is, it is growing in popularity. Some of the biggest pushbacks against it, again, were it was purely energy, which isn't true anymore, that it, um, most of the homes that came out of the passive house were two-story, super ugly boxes, which still is true to some degree <laughs> from an architectural standpoint, but they're getting better. You know, sometimes it, you know, I see a passive house certify and I want to get excited, but I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, it just is ugly. It looks like a terrible commercial building. Uh, but they're getting a lot better and more creative. And the thing about Passive House, too, is that they're looking at a lot of foam-free design. How can we make a super tight building without using foam? What is foam made out of? And what's that? The base, baseline ingredient, first ingredient. Oil, yeah. Made out of oil. So foam is great because it's super energy efficient and it can get into the cracks, but there are ways that we can build completely foam-free homes that are just as tight. It can be done. Um, and so Passive House is really putting some education programming um, around that, which is per you know, great. They're not requiring that you use no foam, at least not at this iteration, but really looking at that. So. Yeah, they would have uh, foam-free design. They have, I know one of the requirements they do have is certain types of foam that have um, higher global warming potential they won't even allow anymore. So they are looking for that um, as a start to start to weed foam out. OK, so all of these programs we talked about essentially weren't green programs, but they were the way to build up to green programs to some degree. So green building programs um, are going to be more holistic in nature and more holistic as we go through them. Um, those ones really were purely energy-focused programs. Um, so let's kind of get into the green ones here. We've got about um, 16 minutes, so we're probably going to roll through some of these um, pretty quick. So the first one is the National um, uh, Green Building Standard. This was started by the Home Innovations Lab, which is a subsidiary of the National Association of Home Builders. Um, it's a rapidly growing program. I think there's over now 80,000 <coughs> projects US-wide certified to this program. Um, they start out looking at the 2009 IECC, International Energy Code, requirements as their baseline. Then what they do is they say, OK, if you can do 2012 IECC, if you can do Energy Star, or if you can use a HERS index, we don't care which one you use. But if you use one of those in our program, that's great. We'll get you some more green points for that. Um, the thing to know about National Green Building Standard is they've hitched themselves to the International Green Construction Code, which is being adopted. The last I checked, it was been adopted by 10 municipalities in the country. So basically, this is saying, we're going to adopt a code that doesn't just look at energy efficiency. It's looking at health, water, how you manage your waste during a construction, where you put your house, what your landscape is like. So there are codes that are emerging, um, and they're being designed from an international level, where they're going to be looking at a full green gamut. And so basically, a silver certified national green building standard home is equivalent to a international green construction code level. So. The neat thing is, is if you're using this program as a guidance tool, um, you, you are essentially meeting a code somewhere that could be coming later. So you're kind of gearing up for that um, if you're using the certification program. Um, and, and one thing I did want to note, too, about these programs, too, is that um, every program I'm going to talk about today, all of their checklists and their resources, the majority of them, all exist online. And you can access them and even use them now, which is really cool. And you can just use them as a guidance without having to commit to anything. Um, some make you buy their manual, others don't, and we'll get into that. But that's one of the things I you know, recommend to anybody who's looking at either just doing a theoretical project or doing their own project or a builder. Just use one of these as a guide and see if it makes sense for you. So ICC 700, you'll see that if you look at it. That just is code saying it stands for residential. Um, international Construction Code 700 is the Residential International Construction Code. IRC is the International Residential Code, same thing, just another word for the same thing. Um, and the National Green Building Standard 700 2012 
actually equals the 2009 code, which I'm not gonna try to figure out how that all happened, but it did, so that's where you're at. So really what you're looking at, you've got a bronze, silver, gold, emerald, so it's not, it's kinda like lead, but it's emerald instead of platinum. And basically what you're saying is a bronze home is 15% better than the 2009 code. So to some degree, 15% better than the current Michigan code to have a bronze certified one. And then look at Emerald and you're 60% better than the 2009 code. So to put that in perspective, you're on that HERS rating, that one with the point threshold, you know, you're looking at like a, a home somewhere around the 40s of a HERS index rating. So 60% more energy efficient than the conventional American code. So, yeah. No, six is, uh, nine is more, is 15% better than nine. But the thing is, is that, that's like on the international level, on the, if a state adopts a code and then, and then they um, change it, that could just, that could throw everything off, so. Like Michigan adopted 2009, but dumbed it down, so. And, and they adopted 15 and did the same. So this program can actually be used on all building types. Uh, they've got some pretty big high-rise buildings um, for the National Green Building Standard. Um, here's sort of how they weight their credits. And so basically what this is just saying is that, you know, to, to certify in the program, you know, 24% of your credits have to come from the resource efficiency section. So materials, local resource materials, recycled content. 28% from the lot. Um, interestingly enough, 16% from energy efficiency. So it doesn't focus that much on energy. So what that really means, you know, it's hard to say what that really means, I mean, without diving into the program, but just to give you some context, this is where what's important to them and how many points you need to pick up in each of these sections. Um, the program does have a manual, um, and it does cost money. They also have a certified green professional designation, which actually has no direct connection to the certification program at all. No connection at all. I did, you don't learn anything about it. Um, so I find it's not like lead AP where you get a point in the rating system if you have a lead AP on your team. Um, it's very odd. So yeah, not related. <laughs> um, just some basic uh, summary here. It's a rapidly growing in popularity. It probably will outpace, if not catch up with the biggest green building program, which we'll get into in a second. Um, it's one of the very few ANSI approved green rating systems out there, so if that's important to have that ANSI certified standard, which is basically just saying we're legit. Um, has that connection to the international code, it has a relationship with the ASHRAE code council, which is very interesting. They actually certify green products, so people can, manufacturers can send products to their lab. The lab will test it and then certify that it says what it does, and then they'll give you extra points if you use their certified products. Um, <laughs> I think their checklist is very, very messy and complicated, but uh, that's just my opinion. And it interestingly rewards larger homes. Um, so, you know, if you, again, it's a home builder association program, and home builders get paid with larger homes. So, you know, there you have it. <laughs> Uh, Green Star, okay, so this program started in Minnesota and is now getting blown up, I guess, across the U.S. or even internationally. I'll just be quite honest with you here. We manage this program now. It started through a partnership with the Twin Cities Home Builders Association, the Twin Cities Remodelers Association, and U of M, which is University of Minneapolis, um, Minnesota. But now we actually manage this program, um, so I won't spend too much time on it. Um, this program basically allows you to utilize your favorite energy scoring system, one that's been approved before, and it looks at an energy use intensity, which is basically how much energy uh, per year per square foot are you using. And then you can pick up your energy points that way, using one of these tools. And you, there's very different reasons you would use one of these tools over another. You would use the home energy score maybe because you're doing a small remodeling project but you would use um, you know, the Woofy Passive House program because you are somebody who is a nerd and you want to know how much the hydraulic flows of water coming past your house are affecting your energy usage because that's what it does. Um, so you can use all these different programs um, for it. 
Um, so just depending on what's important to you um, for the energy modeling, as long as they've been approved. So um, Green Star works. It's made for additions and remodels. It was specifically made to help the millions of homeowners out there who have existing homes and want to be rewarded and make improvements and get some guidance on how to do it. Um, and it's not made for larger projects, and it's in a multifamily pilot right now. Uh, it has an online workbook, completely online. Uh, the workbook's pretty interesting because you can use it to generate scopes of works for bids, for subcontractors, um, for accountability forms. So you know you can generate all those forms, and it will say, "Here, HVAC contractor, here's what you need to do based on what we're doing." And it's sort of pre-made based on what you're trying to accomplish. So we tried to create it for that scope of work generator. One thing that's interesting is that they were still the only green rating system and one of the first ever to recognize that exposure to electromagnetic fields may be a problem. Um, this is more popular in Europe right now, but uh, now we're starting to look at issues that are coming from our exposure to all the magnetic fields, the Wi-Fi fields, everything else, and we're saying, are there some very simple ways we can design a home to not be expo expo exposed to electrical loads and that won't cost any more money, just simple things that we can think about. And so the program has some recommendations on that. We're in the middle of a five-part series with some really cool people out of California and Minnesota who are like ta telling us about how to do this stuff, why it's important, and what's some simple things you can do. If you have a client who's concerned about EMF exposure or just you know wants to be um, you know use the precautionary principle. The other thing that the program has designed into it is. Um, something through the partnership of the um, Disability Advocates of Kent County. They have a zero-step program that allows you to design a home to, for accessibility features. And so we've built that right into the program so you can make simple adjustments to your design or remodels that can allow a home to be more accessible. And I'll tell you what, I live in a 1928 year old old home and I can walk, everyone can, we're all, you know, we're all very um, mobile, but it, you know, it's terrible. And I started to notice as I had a young kid that homes, accessibility can affect anybody, no matter what situation they're in. And that it needs to be incorporated into green building. And, and it will be, it is starting to be, so. Um, let's skip through some of this stuff and get to the cool one. Um, Lead for Homes, Leadership and Energy and Environmental Design, um, started by the USGBC in the commercial sector in the 90s, I think, right, Anthony, in the early 90s? Mid-90s, yeah. Um, and then 2005-ish, they launched a pilot program, and our organization became one of the providers for it. Um, this program is built on the HERS index for its basic energy modeling points. It uses Energy Star um, as a requirement, again, just building off the success of the Energy Star program. Um, if you're doing a mid-rise building, it uses ASHRAE 2007, 90.1, 15% above that. Um, for that program. Uh, LEED works for a majority of buildings. We're even, we've got a 12-story project going on in Chicagoland right now. Um, additions and remodels, again, you're basing it off Energy Star, so just, just really difficult. The other thing about LEED is they're looking at behind the shower and tub surround. We don't want to see uh, paper-faced drywall being used because it gets moldy back there. So the, the bathroom's got to be gutted and we got to do like a Duroc or a really tight tiling. Um, so again, if you're not planning a bathroom gut, but you want to lead certify your home, you know that gets in the way. And then of course, either we got to tear out the exterior, or exterior or the interior walls. Someone's got to see behind those walls. So again, may not make sense for you know for every single home um, in the world. So lead has most of its credits weighted in energy and atmosphere. The USGBC has determined that climate change is the number one threat. And so to stem me that, they have put most of their eggs into the energy basket, uh, at least according to them. I mean, you can see that there has been some pushback against lead in the energy world. But uh, so that's where most of your points are being made up in the program, you know, second to air quality in the home. And then, um, you know, what's, what kind of impact that the site is having landscaping water usage out there. Um, if you're familiar with LEED 
for commercial, Lead for Homes works a little bit differently. Um, commercial uses Lead Online and a commissioning agent. Um, and Lead for Homes uses a provider and a green raider. And there's no Lead Online at all. We, I am Lead Online. You have to talk to me, so, uh, or you have to talk to my quality assurance director. Um, so it's a little bit different. They're moving more towards a Lead Online aspect, which I think is a good thing. Um, but right now it's made up of 40 providers around the country who are you know, living, breathing people that have to go in as a third party and inspect and document everything in the building, um, which to some degree uh, knocks down a lot of the documentation requirements. If you've ever heard about LEED, New Construction has a lot of documentation. Uh, LEED for Homes has a lot less because there is a third party rater in there visually inspecting everything and signing a couple of accountability forms saying, yep, that's all in there and we're good to go. And then we inspect their work. Uh, huge, it, it's a very popular program. Um, and the cool thing is, is that a lot of it's, you know, nearly half of it's in affordable housing. So you say, you can't do green in affordable housing, it costs too much. That's not true. You know, nearly 50% of the LEED certifications are in the affordable housing realm because you can't not do green in affordable housing, is what we would argue. Um, and there's over 150,000 units certified um, across the country and growing. Um, just exponential growth in the certification of this program. This is the most internationally recognized certification program, both residential and commercial, um, growing across the country. You know, one of the reasons is, is because you, got, you walk into your local Starbucks or you walk into your local office, you know, and you say, hey, the office is LEED certified, Starbucks is LEED certified, my grocery store is LEED certified, why can't my house be? So we get lots of homeowners asking us that question um, when they're coming to build here in West Michigan. Um, here's just some quick, you know, big shout out to Ohio who got number six. We do a lot of work down there as far as number of certified projects. And uh, I guess all the countries that didn't do LEED got whited out completely, so. Screw them. But uh, you can see it's growing. It's a growing. So lead, lead NC is much bigger than this, but Lead for Homes, again, growing across the country. We just talked to somebody in Mexico the other day. Um, lead uses the Green Associates as its foundation, heavily steeped into commercials. So if you're only considered, concerned about residential, you've got to bear it through the associates and learn all about commercial first. <laughs> and then you get to the Lead AP Homes, and then voila, you're focused on residential buildings single family, multi-family, um, and how to uh, design and build those. Um, there's lots of friendly and not so friendly policies all over the country. Um, it's impossible to ban lead, but it is possible for state governments to say, you know, won't use state tax dollars to build state-based buildings on lead, which is something that Ohio has done. Uh, now, I don't know if they've taken that back yet or not, but it's one thing that they've done. So has a lot of political ramifications. Um, LEED will be upgrading on my birthday, so happy birthday to me on Halloween this year. That's my, all I wanted. Um, it's gonna get harder, um, but more interesting, it's gonna be focusing on an energy and water monitoring, especially in units, making sure tenants understand their water and energy usage. It's gonna be looking at the life cycle analysis of materials. Um, it's gonna be focusing Having more of a home's going to need to be a little more urban, if you will. And if not, they're going to have to focus more on energy efficiency if they're more rural. Uh, it'll have a water performance calculator similar to the way you would model energy. You can now water, you can model your water usage, kind of like what I showed you in that EPA tool. Um, and they no longer have a home size adjuster. So, yeah. So it's in pilot, and you can use it. and. Anyone we talk to, we tell them to, but you don't have to use it right now. So if it's, and we've got Habitat Kent County, huge leader in it. Really respect that they've pilot championed it. We've learned a lot working with them. And, um, but no, it's not, you're not the only one, so. And also, does that mean if you're a small lead home, a small SFMA home, don't get that point bonus anymore? For, for, well, so the home size adjuster got moved to Energy Star. Um, so now it just says, if you have you know more bedrooms, less square footage, you or less bedrooms, more square footage, right? That's the ratio. Um, then you need to have a better HERS index score. Um, so it forces you to have a higher energy score if you build a bigger home with less bedrooms. So.
to some degree, yes, it still has it. So. I'm, so what I'm planning on doing is, you know, those three days before, I'm just going to stay up all night because I'm expecting a lot of people to call me and say, I need to register now. I don't want to get forced into V4. So, yeah, you can, you can get under 2008 now um, before that. That but would be a completion date of October. No, no, no. You have until 2018. Yeah, you have until 2018 to wrap your project up. So. Right. Um, I'm going to go through these two other programs here pretty quick. The Enterprise Green Communities Foundation program is um, a program somewhat like Lead NC. Uh, so there's a lot of online documentation management going on with this program. It was designed for the affordable housing or communities. It's a completely free program. There's no certification fees like there are with USGBC. And it is a growing program. Um, and it's built right into our low income housing tax credit code here in the state. You can either use this program or you can use LEED. Many of the states have that for housing tax credits. And um, I would say it's a, it's a pretty reputable program. It uses HERS and Energy Star. It uses, um, let's see, it uses ASHRAE, just like LEED does. You know, it has a lot of the same aspects that LEED does. Um, you can use it on all building types as long as they have most residential space and they are designated for affordable housing. Um, one of the thing that's neat is it has a really cool online management tool. I don't know if any of you have ever used Lead NC before, Lead Online, but from what I understand, that thing's a mess. Maybe it's better now, but this thing, I love this thing, and it's all done online, and it's a great management to manage your entire team and to get your documentation up there. Whether you're certifying or not, uh, I encourage you to check out their portal. It's completely free to sign up and, and get on there. So again, this is focused on Typically affordable housing, and it also gives you some leeway on moderate rehabs, uh, whereas LEED will not give you that leeway. So we get a lot of moderate rehabs, projects that aren't gutting you know, the walls and stuff like that. So, um, I want to jump into the last program here. Oh. Has anyone ever had of the, heard of the Living Building Challenge? All right, so you know, this is the one that I was talking about with that towards restorative design. Like, we get really excited about this program, um, but it certainly takes a lot of effort. It ha takes a really willing client, and we have a few clients in, or we know some people who work in uh, Michigan, uh, in Illinois, who are pursuing this, and it's really great to work on these projects. You know, again, you're, you're looking at, um, uh, you know, you're looking at uh, focusing on all of these areas. Um, net positive energy, so having storage so you can have two weeks of energy if the grid goes down, that's required. Capturing, cleaning all of your water on the site. You have to drink all of your water on the site. You have to remediate all of your water on the site. Um, you're looking at actually monitoring health and happiness of a building and its occupants and the people around the building. Um, you're looking at the material components of the building. Where, where are they coming from? What are they made of? Are they on a red list? Do they have PVC? You know, you're looking at all of that stuff. You're asking a lot of in-depth questions. You're looking at equity again. Can everybody access this building? Can everybody interact with it? Is the building an impediment to somebody's rights, their rights to nature, their rights to sunlight? Um, and is the, is the building beautiful? You have to design a beautiful building. Otherwise, you can't, you can't sort of find the program. So no ugly buildings. So that's cool. Um, and, and, and so, you know, these all have lots of caveats and exceptions to them. And then they also have the, 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 the globes, the galaxies, I guess, maybe, first zero energy certification program internationally recognized. So if you're just focused on zero energy, you can certify under that. We've got a few projects in Minneapolis doing that. What's really exciting about this program, again, is it's just it's asking those questions. Why can't we drink our own rainwater? Why are people in Flint being poisoned by water but it's illegal to drink rainwater in Michigan. It's asking those kinds of questions, you know? I don't know, but let's keep asking those questions and, and let's figure out what are the real things that get in the way of sustainability. Is it really because it costs too much? Maybe, and you know, we're working on that, but there are also legal things that get in the way of sustainability. There are perceptions that get in the way. And so they have an ambassador program. You can become an ambassador, you can go out and you can get people really angry and you can start talking about all this stuff and you can get them excited and you know you can get that credential if you want to they also have a 
Living Future Accreditation, which if you already have your lead AP, you can kind of build off this and you know, keep moving forward and use that as a baseline. Um, and most of the continuing education is happening in the Pacific Northwest right now where they're headquartered. But um, you know, this is a gr growing global program because it's, the reason it's growing so fast, I think it's very rooted in place. It doesn't, it's not a point system, it's not a checklist system. It's like, how do we make the most sustainable, most restorative project in the location that we're working in um, is really what this, uh, this program has. So. Uh, oh, and this is Matt Grokoff. You can check out happyhome.how over in Ann Arbor. He took a 110-year-old home and he changed it into a net zero home, net positive home, while driving a Volt. Um, and this is really cool. He's got a cool home. You walk in and you're like, this is just some old home that somebody made it look nice. You would never know it was you know, completely zero energy, all electric. Um, very inspiring. So he used the Living Building Challenge as his guidance there. So again, you know, the question we ask is, you know, which one of these programs, where do you want to be, where are your clients? As a designer, where do you want to be? Um, you know, that sort of that continuum. We've seen somebody over the four years we've worked with this guy in Chicagoland, he moved along this continuum like it was just like perfect. He went from like building almost illegal homes to, uh, you know, designing living building challenge homes using every one of those programs we talked about over the last four years. And now he's got his own living building challenge house that he's building for himself. We're gonna be doing a tour of it here soon. Um, so it's very inspirational to, uh, to see that and, and to, um, you know, to really put our work into um, saying, if I can look back when I'm 50, 60, 70 and say, you know, I've done what I could and I've made the best with my design, with my construction process, um, you know, I think that's inspiring. So, thank you. I think we have a minute for questions. <laughs> yeah. 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 Good. Yeah, Brandon, he's uh, he does a lot, so. Yeah. I'm excited to see the final construction tour of his home soon. Yeah. So of all the certification programs you talked about, which one do you think is growing the fastest? Like the real uh, Statistically, it looks like the National Green Building, st well, let me take that back. If you're, if you're talking about green standards, that National Green Building Standard, Home Builder one, that one is just exploding. If you're talking about home energy labels, the Department of Energy's home energy score, you know, that is just growing exponentially. It's getting built right into building codes and if you do weatherization or utility programs. So between those two, I think they're going to come out pretty high. I feel like LEED is leveling off a lot. And when V4 comes out, I'm really wondering what will happen to it. It may just go out of business entirely. I don't know. I, I'm just saying what half the other people tell me, so. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, you know, when I talked about the International Green Construction Code, you know, I have a feeling like, I, I, it seems like if we start to, if, if municipalities adopt a green code and then just say, we're gonna continue to evolve this green code into something like the Living Building Challenge in the future. So I'd imagine, you know, by you know, 2050, which I believe we've set our goal to be a zero energy planet, uh, that's what I understand the goal to be, uh, our construction codes are going to have to get us there. So uh, I would imagine in the future, you know, we'll have less of these programs and just a basic, hey, if you're going to design or build in this area, this is the, the model you have to follow. Is that 